game of cricket, one man stands alone as the greatest all-rounder ever seen. Greatest batsman of all time, Don Bradman. Greatest cricketer of all time, Gary Sobers. I don't think there has been anyone that has done what Sir Garfield Sobers did. He was an extraordinary batsman. He could bowl at pace. Oh, he's bowled it. He can bowl slow, orthodox or unorthodox. He was a superb infieldsman and a glorious outfieldsman. What more can you do? Sobers was like having three guys in your team. What a wonderful shot. Absolutely awesome. He was your complete cricketer. Best I've ever seen. Gary Sobers was a hero to a nation. He retired after two decades holding almost every record in the book and setting the standard for generations to follow. People in the Caribbean, I don't think we'll ever forget, but the name Sir Garfield Sobers or the name Gary Sobers, forget the Sir. And even kids who don't know exactly what he did have heard about Gary Sobers. But safe. Tremendous Watching Gary Sobers play, that sort of fueled my uh, fires as far as um, cricket was concerned. Left-hander, you know, did it all, fast bowler, bold spin, batted, batted aggressively. You know, brilliant fielder, you know, just had the lot. Sobers was born Garfield St Auburn Sobers in July 1936 to Chamont and Thelma Sobers of Bridgetown Barbados. He was the fifth of six children. And uh, there was no money ready for the Sobers family to buy gear and that type of thing. And bats were made from pieces of wood, for instance, and, and balls were made from, from tar, which was taken off the, the road. There was also marble cricket, known as Lilliputian cricket, for obvious reasons, where the batsman batted on his knee. Most cricketers from the Caribbean come from humble beginnings. Bib Richards, he came from humble beginnings as well. Andy Roberts, one of the best bowlers, Malcolm Marshall, came from humble beginnings, and that is typical of Caribbean cricketers. A lot of cricketers in the Caribbean saw cricket as a way of progress, getting a better life. He played everything. He played soccer. He played basketball to a very good level. In fact, he, he represented Bobby Dis at, at soccer and at basketball at a a younger age than he did at cricket. He became very strong in playing against boys who were much older than he was. He was more than their equal with batting, bowling, and fielding, he could do anything. But there was a, a little bit of a controversy, I suppose you would say, with Sobers and the older um, members of the club, the cricket club, um, in the area. The, they said, no, we're not gonna let let uh, the young Sobers be exposed to playing against big men in the more established clubs in, from the Barbados Cricket League, which was really the Village League, and they decided that they wouldn't let him play. But eventually the young Sobers made it impossible not to select him. Despite being unable to play a note of music, he was recruited by the Barbados Police Band, qualifying for the police first grade team. And in fact, his first hundred was made for police against Wanderers. Sobers had shown enough talent in just two first-class matches to be selected for the West Indies. His third first-class appearance was his test debut on March the 30th, 1954. Just to show you how talented he must have been when you're playing first-class cricket at 16 and then you're playing test, test cricket at 17. That is not an easy feat, especially in the Caribbean. A lot of people in Asia hear about young kids in Asia getting to test match level at a fairly early age. But not in the Caribbean. I do not think there has ever been another teenage test cricketer in the Caribbean. So that was a fantastic feat by Gary, just to show you how talented he must have been. To make a debut at, at age 17 is, is damn difficult for starters. But I think 
probably the more remarkable thing about Sobis was that he actually made his debut as a number nine batsman and as a left arm orthodox spinner. And not long after doing that, he was then sent in to open the batting against Australia with Linwall and Miller bowling. I mean, no, uh, you know, that, that was no easy task facing those two guys. But not only was Sobers sent in to open the batting as a very young kid, but he was told to take on Linwell and Miller. He was given those instructions by his captain and take them on he did. He got, I think in that innings he got four, something like 44 and he hit about eight or nine fours. So he obviously did take them on. And probably that was the thing that decided the West Indies that number nine was a bit low in the batting order. He would make his 60s and 50s and so on. But as he says, he was shifted up and down the order. He felt that he needed some regular position in the order. And there were those who said, not to worry. This chap has the potential to make big runs. And when he makes the breakthrough, they'll slow. And of course, the breakthrough came when he broke Sir Len Hutton's record of 364, a record which had stood since 1938. And this was 1958 against Pakistan at Sabina Park in Kingston, he made 365, not only would have gone on and made some more, but uh, the, the crowd was so excited they rushed onto the ground, and as it was, the score was uh, over 700 and the declaration was in order, um, and therefore the captain, Jerry Alexander, declared, Sobers was left 365, not out. For your first test 100 to be the world record score is, you know, it's quite remarkable, but once you got to know the guy, um, you're not surprised because he, you know, he could just do anything. I suppose it was always in, there was always the possibility he was going to do something very special. I mean, the genius of Sobers was evident very early. I mean, another one to have done the 300, of course, on debut was Bob Simpson. And it was patently clear from a very early age, too, that he had something special. But they certainly went about that in very different ways. Um, <coughs> Simpson batted interminably and very effectively. Um, but, of course, Sobers played with all the flair and panache that we came to know in, uh, in future years. And uh, that, was his, uh, that was his greatness. He's gone for the play. And, of course, the glorious thing was when his inning was to be bettered, of course, and uh, there was uh, Brian Lara was going to achieve something very special. Sobers was there to witness it and to applaud Lara and has been a great admirer of Lara's. And that says much of one great player of one generation talking about another player of another generation. I think Gary Sobers was very proud of the fact that Brian Lara broke that record. So I don't think Gary thought, oh, hell, my record is going to be broken. And it was broken by a great batsman and another West Indian. It was another West Indian who inspired Sobers. His close personal friend, Frank Worrell, was captain of the team on Gary's first tour to Australia in 1960. One of the weaknesses historically of West Indian cricket has been a lack of direction on and off the ground. Worrell was able to provide that direction at a critical time, and he was fortunate that uh, Sobers came through at that point, but so was Sobers, that he had Worrell as a leader at that time to direct him. It was a, a very significant appointment because prior to that, West Indies were captained only by white amateur players. Even though there were so many outstanding uh, black players, if the West Indies had gone to Australia in 60-61 under Frank Worrell, the first black captain, and failed, there would have been it would have been a tremendous psychological setback to the people of the Caribbean. Quite the opposite, it was uh, a huge success in every, every way. Uh, the West Indies played attacking cricket. Australia's captain, Richie Benno, um, joined them in that. That was a series of the Thai test, and that later on in life you get to appreciate what that all meant to Caribbean people and how much interest there was in the West Indies team being in Australia. <laughs> Sobers would score 132 on the first day of the first test at the Gabba. Some observers, including the South Australian selector, the great Don Bradman, considered it the best hundred they'd ever seen. Bradman certainly liked what he saw, and uh, Bradman was a fair judge of great players too, um, and of course established a very good rapport with him. The next one will win the match. Hunt's throw is coming back. It's wonderfully accurate, and he's out. The match went down in legend as the first ever tied test. And Hall bowls. 
Push the leg, they're running for anything now. And Joe Sullivan throws for a second time, hits the stumps, and the match is tied. The first tie in Test match history. Not only was it a tie, but uh, the scoring rates were, were outstanding, and it revitalized Test cricket. And even though the West Indies lost the series to one, it was a very close series. They only lost the last Test match by two wickets. And uh, the crowds and the people of Australia were so enamored by the West Indies' way of playing the game at that time that when they were leaving, something estimated uh, in the vicinity of 100,000 were in the streets of Melbourne to, to bid them farewell and, and to say, we hope you come back soon again. It was tremendous. Sobers would average 43 with the bat and take 15 wickets in the series. Calypso cricket had arrived in Australia and Sobers personified it. On the strength of those performances, Bradman offered him a contract to play for South Australia. Sobers was an immediate success. He topped the batting and bowling averages at South Australia. His attacking style and influence would inspire the likes of future Australian captain Ian Chappell. Oh, I saw, you know, Sobers at his best against Benno and Davidson. And, I mean, uh, I remember Richie bringing Davidson back on to bowl to try and slow Sobers down. And he hit him for 6-4-6. Six, six. And, and then Davo always tells the story, but I got him out. <laughs> but, you know, for an for 18-year-old kid to see that innings and to see it played against players of that ilk, you know, Benno and, and Davidson, who I'd grown up admiring greatly and, uh, and knowing them as match winners, and here's this suddenly, suddenly this guy belting them all around the park. So obviously that left a, a big impression on me. It was a generation that shared its knowledge, and the game was played uh, at a pace where you could share that knowledge. The modern game is so frenetic. The players move from one form of the game to another form of the game and from venue to venue, country to country, so quickly that there's not the mateship, there's not the camaraderie, there's not the, the time together in the rooms. And Sobers, uh, like many great champions of that time, was happy to share that knowledge. And uh, Chapel is just but one of a number of high-profile players who benefited enormously from the counsel and advice of Sobers at that time. To play in the same team and to, to quite often be batting at the other end and to see it, you know, right up close, to see what he did up close. I mean, that was amazing enough. But the thing that I've always said about Gary Sobers, not only was he a champion cricketer, but he... Sobers succeeded uh, Frank World as captain of the West Indies, uh, first led the West Indies in 1965 after World's retirement. And in his first series, led the West Indies to, to their first Test Series victory over Australia. Perhaps significant in that because he had a, a close affinity with Australia. 1960-61 um, series had established himself there and then uh, had gone back to Australia to play for South Australia and uh, even married an Australian girl as well. And uh, for him to have done that, to have led the West Indies to their first Test Series victory over Australia, uh, in the Caribbean in 1965 in his first series as captain uh, was a momentous occasion for, for Gary Sobers. Nash bowling now to Sobers. Nash he's got to pick that. That was the right distance. He's hit that out of the ground. While Sobers was well known for the stylishness of his approach to the game, he could also be brutal. Playing for Nottinghamshire against Glamorgan in Swansea 1968, he would become the first batsman in the history of the game to hit six sixes from one over. The bowler whose name is etched in history was Malcolm Nash. That's another one. Goodness gracious me, that tap at the top. You see the chap climbing up there to have a look over the wall. That... 52 and 29 minutes. That's another one up in the enclosure. The last person we saw hit like this is Marty Jahangir in that wonderful knock against the Morgan. Sure that uh, some batsmen might have tried it, but Sobers went three sixes and then might have said to himself, hey, I can go all, all six deliveries, and he tried, of course, and succeeded, as Sobers tended to do in everything else in the game.
Oh, he's got that shorter one. It's up again. There it is, bouncing on the bouncing on the concrete. Four sixes in four balls. We've had some very good hitting, a very good 140 by Bowless. But this makes him 64. The fifth six would actually be caught on the boundary before the fielder fell over the rope trying to hold on. And that will just carry. Now he's going to be out. Caught out. Oh! He dropped it over the boundary. Five on the trot. 70 on the board. And he's done it! He's done it! And my goodness, it's gone way down to Swansea. It was the, the first occasion that it happened, and to add to his world record 365 not out at the time um which you know these those were two records which he held uh perhaps sobers doesn't give it all that credit you now because he hit six sixes uh he was just going for it but uh it at the time and even now it resonates as uh one of the outstanding feats of the game i, I remember thinking there's only one bloke could do it and, and that would be sobers if somebody said that uh, there's been six six that six six is hit at St. Helens, you'd say I bet Sorbers has hit him. Sobers became a legend in England. The West Indian captain was one of the first to tread what is now a well-worn path for professional cricketers. Arguably the greatest ever ambassador for Calypso cricket, Sobers would captain a rest of the world team to tour England and Australia. Magnificent shot, he fastened onto that like a panther. Those series were arranged when scheduled series against South Africa for England and uh, against South Africa for Australia were, were cancelled because of South Africa's apartheid policies and the international movement towards boycotting South Africa because of them had uh, come to the fore. South Africa's apartheid policy meant that they only played against white nations. Playing for South Australia against a touring South Africa, the normally bareheaded Sobers wanted to make a statement. Gary, who was batted number four for South Australia, said, Hey, Skip, is it all right if I bat in the West Indies cap today, you see? And, you know, my ears sort of pricked up, and I thought, that's a bit strange. And now Les thought for a while and he said, yeah, that's fine, Gary. And he went out and he batted in this West Indies cap and he belted the South Africans all over the park, got 100 and did it in absolute style. And it always fascinated me why he'd asked that. Throw forward now to 1991 where I'm, I'm in the Caribbean covering the series for Channel 9 against the West Indies. And I'm having a few beers with Gary in a Barbados beach bar, you see, and we'd had a couple of beers, and <clears throat> I said, Gary, you remember when you asked Les if you could wear the West Indies cap against South Africa? I said, why'd you do that? And it's a typical Sobers answer. He said, well, Ian, he said, uh, in those days, he said, South Africa had never played against the West Indies. He said, uh, they'd, uh, they'd never seen a West Indies cap, and he said, I thought it was time they had a good long look at one. It's found the gap there, and this is going to be his 150, isn't it? The team assembled to represent the rest of the world against England in 1970 was bristling with superstars from Australia, South Africa, India, Pakistan and the West Indies. The unofficial five-test series was won 4-1 by the rest of the world, with Sobers again the star, topping the batting and bowling averages, scoring two centuries, three fifties and taking 21 wickets. While the rest of the world had dominated England, their next tour to Australia was considered a much tougher assignment. It was his innings in the third test at the MCG in 1972 that most endeared Sobers to an adoring Australian public. They struggled in Perth. Second test match against Australia, rest of the world, on a fast, pacey pitch in Perth. They fronted up a young tearaway by the name of Dennis Liddy. And everyone knows at the time that uh, the Wacker pitch was perhaps the fastest and bounciest in world cricket. And uh, they, were, they were rolled over for 59. Sobers was uh, out for a duck. 
to a lily. And then in the first innings in Melbourne, Dennis bowled it, bounced him out again. First ball got him for a duck, caught sort of second, third slip somewhere off the shoulder of the bat. And so people were sort of starting to say, oh, has Lily got the edge on Sobers? Now, I, I don't know if people were writing that. I wish they hadn't because it's a very silly thing to do is to upset Gary Sobers. And through the field, that's it. Four runs. And uh, there were questions being asked about whether Sobers could play genuine fast bowling. Um, at that time, you know, how much longer did Sobers have uh, in the game? And, and things like that, and I, I'm pretty sure that all the talk did fire up Sobers, made him very determined uh, for his next innings to go in there and show that all the doubts over him were, were misdirected, that he still had it in him. After Dennis had got him out for a duck, we were sitting having a drink in the dressing room, and Gary walked into our dressing room, you see, and he, and he walked straight over to Dennis. Dennis was sitting there, and he tapped him on the shoulder, and he said, hey, listen, son, he said... Um, he said, I can bowl bounces too. He said, but I bat better than you. See, and we all laughed. It was with the bats where Sobers would really make his mark. During the second innings, he reached his century in 129 balls and was 139 not out at the end of day three. There was a, a straight drive he played against Lilly, um, which is still talked about in, in cricket circles, when Sobers acknowledges that he had to change his mind halfway through the shot. Um, and uh, managed to do so, had to hit him down the ground for four. Straight down the ground, great shot, beautiful shot. It just goes to show how quick he was, quick in thought, quick in movement um, and quick in eye. Magnificent shot, and Sobers does not move from the crease. He was an extraordinary player, so much poise, so much balance and of course placement. Something which is often overlooked was the placement. He could place the ball immaculately. Magnificent shot, and that's four runs. There's his 250. Sobers would reach his 250 with 33 fours and two sixes. He was eventually dismissed for 254. He could be out. Doug Waters. Bottom mid on. Gary Sobers leaves the ground. The crowd is standing. I'll say no more. Just listen to that crowd. The innings was described by Don Bradman as probably the greatest exhibition of batting ever seen in Australia. That's the ultimate accolade, isn't it? The ultimate uh, compliment from uh, the great man, the greatest batsman. He approached uh, test cricket, any cricket, as if it was a club match. He was relaxed. It was as, as if he was playing cricket in the Bayland with the boys with whom he had grown up. And that was something which came across in everything he did on a cricket field. Um, whether it was a test match, a first class match, whatever it was, Sobers always looked at ease, always enjoying himself, never struggling. You, so many of those who played with and against him will say that they've never seen Sobers really struggle when he was batting, bowling, everything came naturally to him. When he retired in 1974, after 93 tests, he'd scored 8,032 runs and taken 235 wickets. Gary Sobers would be knighted for his services to the game by Queen Elizabeth in Barbados in 1975. But his greatness lies in his awesome all-round talent and the way he played the game. He was a gent for a start, Gary. Um, he knew how good he was. And again, he, he had a, a great respect for the game and for the people he played against. You'll never, I've never ever heard a bad word about Gary Sobers from anybody. And he took everybody to the cleaners. There wasn't anything that was normal about Gary's cricket. He was, I mean, the word genius is probably tossed around a bit too often, but in my book, Gary was a cricketing genius. I don't think we need worry about that. That's gone right into the crowd. And in recent times, we've seen some of the greatest batsmen of all time. Extraordinary talents, Tendulkar, Lara, Ponting, extraordinarily gifted men. Um, 
but you're invariably in discussions. The first name that always bobs up was Bradman, and then comes Sobers. Who was the greatest cricketer? Certainly the greatest batsman, unquestionably, was Bradman. What a good piece of bowling. But when it comes to the greatest cricketer, you can mount a very strong argument indeed for, for Sobers. 